Greetings students, Mr. Little here, and today we're going to have a look at the African Diaspora. This is chapter 25, part 3, and this is looking at the African Diaspora, that is a community outside of its place of origin. So at the end of this video, you should be able to answer the following two essential questions. How does the American African Diaspora represent both a change and a continuity in global world history? And how did Africans contribute to the cultural innovations in the Atlantic world during this time period? So it's important to quickly define what a diaspora is. A diaspora is a scattered population whose origins lie in a separate geographic locale. Um, a really great example of a diaspora would be the Jewish diaspora that existed in, say, the Middle East and Europe for much of human history. Um, after the Jewish people were driven from their homeland during a revolt against the Romans, uh, they established communities outside of what they considered to be their home. And much in this way, the African diaspora is largely perceived to be created by uh, the states involved in the Atlantic slave trade. And today you see individuals of African descent in places like the Caribbean, Brazil, the contemporary United States, uh, and parts of South America. Uh, and so this is sort of the origins, these are the origins of the African diaspora. However, I really do want to stress that although it, the majority of Africans, uh, people of African descent that live outside of Africa, were a result of the slave trade, there was a sizable community outside of Africa before the Atlantic slave trade. And we can see traces of it uh, throughout early history. So for example, we know that in the Mediterranean during Roman times, there were uh, African merchants uh, in, in Egypt and the Eastern Mediterranean. We know that there was an ambassador uh, to the Roman Empire that's mentioned in the Christian Bible, uh, mentioned by John the Evangelist, converting this uh, Ethiopian ambassador. We know that there were African mercenaries in the Roman army that were recruited um, via, sometimes they had been slaves, sometimes they were recruited from North Africa. Uh, we also know that in the early Islamic worlds, there was Bilal ibn Rabah, who was the first uh, individual who did the call to prayer uh, in the Islamic community, who was a formerly enslaved Ethiopian. Uh, we do have records that there were court eunuchs uh, during the Yuan and the Ming dynasties that were from Africa. So there were even Africans on the Chinese court. Uh, in South Asia, that is what's now India and, and parts of Pakistan and Bangladesh, there were communities of African merchants known as Sidis, uh, mostly from East Africa, although not strictly. They could also be from North Africa as well. Uh, one very particular famous city who was a former slave uh, but rose to become a kingmaker in the Deccan of southern India uh, was Malik Ambar, who was a slave originally in what is now Ethiopia. He then was traded into the Middle East where he learned to read and write, and then he was traded uh, in into uh, what's now India where he became a soldier and fought, on, and fought against the Mughal Empire during their period of expansion. So just want to really clearly establish that there were Africans outside of Africa pre-Atlantic diaspora. But the, again, to, to really stress it, um, the numbers as they are estimated from both the Atlantic and the Islamic slave trade uh, removed perhaps 24 million people out of the continent of Africa over a thousand years. Now, of course, this is an estimate. There is no way to know for sure exactly. Um, but this is what the most more scholars who have uh, put together the numbers as best they can um, have come up with this number. And we did talk a little bit about the Islamic slave trade earlier, which definitely lasted longer. The last one of the last countries to abolish slavery was Saudi Arabia in the mid 60s. Um, but the Atlantic slave trade was more intense of the two, arguably removing an estimated 12 million individuals over 300 years versus 12 million individuals over a thousand years. The Atlantic slave trade was also different because this is a form of chattel slavery, where slaves were not viewed as people, rather they were viewed as property and treated as such and had laws created as such. Um, and this is a real contrast, a, a real difference. Now, slavery, of course, is bad no matter how you spit it. Um, Slavery is not how we in our contemporary society view as a good way to organize society. But nonetheless, there's a fundamental difference between chattel slavery, in which one is a piece of property, not a human, and something like debt bondage or as a prisoner of war, which was the most common form of slavery uh, in Africa itself during this time. Uh, and it's also worth remembering that within Africa itself, um, the slave trade existed in part because there was a shortage of arable land. And so land was not property, but people were property. And so it was not uncommon for kings to have lots of slaves they didn't necessarily do anything with. Um, there was an account of a European traveler who noticed that the king had a slave that looked too old to do any work. And he asked him, why do you have the slave? And the king said, I like this guy. I keep him around. So it's really, I cannot stress enough uh, 
how chattel slavery forms a fundamental distinction uh, in the history of slavery. Uh, and chattel slavery also means that slavery as an inherited status. So if your father was a slave and, and you're in a chattel slavery system, um, not by default, but the way it happened to evolve in, in most chattel slavery systems, you would also uh, be a slave. Uh, this may not be the case in other systems where if your father owed a debt, um, you would not inherit that debt upon his passing. Um, one of the most harrowing parts about the Atlantic slave trade was the distance slaves were removed. It was one of the longest slave trades, uh, longest continuous slaving routes. And the middle passage refers to the voyage uh, between Africa and parts of the Americas, perhaps the Caribbean or Brazil or maybe the southern United States in which perhaps 20% of slaves, one in five, didn't make it. Um, it was a very, very violent trip. Um, captains would cram uh, as many slaves as they could into the bottom of their ships. Um, and in part because they were insured, sometimes captains wouldn't hesitate to throw their cargo overboard if they were sick or dying or something uh, was wrong, especially after the slave trade was abolished. If they suspected they might be caught by an anti-slaving nation, they might just throw their cargo overboard. No problem. Uh, it's insured. Um, the cruelty really on display is, is genuinely harrowing. Um, if you would like a visualization of all this, there was a movie that came out uh, called Amistad, which describes one of the few successful uh, slave revolts uh, in history uh, on a Spanish ship called, known as Amistad. And there's a, there's a section about a, a, an eight minute scene in the movie that depicts the middle passage fairly accurately. I do have to warn you, it is incredibly hard to watch though. Um, but if you if you really want to see what the Middle Passage was like, that scene gives a fairly good visual uh, of what you're looking for. Now, the Amistad was a slave revolt that that was successful, uh, but the slaves at that time were so, were already in the Western Hemisphere. They already sailed to the United States. Um, there's only one known instance of uh, a slave revolt actually taking control of a ship and sailing back to Africa on their own. And that was in the early days of the trade. So there were a lot of revolts, but only one known uh, successful revolt. So it is not as though individuals did not attempt to escape, uh, but it was very hard uh, to do so. And there's only one known successful revolt. Um, it's also worth noting that um, at this point, chattel slavery, th there's a lot of debate that goes on amongst historians about uh, the connection between the chattel nature of Atlantic slavery and the, the racial element of it. That is uh, the fact that most of the slaves had a very particular phenotype or skin color and how that may have eventually developed into our perceptions of race and racism. Uh, there's a lot of discussion that goes on there. I personally don't think that the two can be separated. Um, but it is worth noting that at this time, Africans were not the only people enslaved as well. Um, within the Americas, it's known that at least 400,000 Native Americans were, were shipped, say, from uh, the Carolinas down to uh, the English colonies in the Caribbean uh, to work on plantations. Um, we do have records that there were a handful of Arab slaves in some of the Spanish colonies. Uh, so that the, you know, from prisoners of war uh, during uh, battles against the Ottomans or from other parts of the Middle East. And in the Ottoman Empire, uh, there were several million Slavic slaves, mostly not doing manual labor, um, mostly working in palaces and residences. But this was also a famous uh, slaving area. Most of them came from what is now Ukraine, parts of Russia, parts of Poland. Um, so slavery was fairly widespread, but the, the overwhelming uh, majority of slaves at this point in history were working in the Americas from Africa. Uh, and slavery also can be compared to other coercive labor systems. Sometimes you will see on the internet uh, comparison, comparisons of like uh, slaves in uh, the Caribbean who were Irish prisoners of war. Um, and while that's definitely true, especially in, in the context of Oliver Cromwell's campaigns against Ireland, Irish uh, fighters were captured and then shipped to the Caribbean to do work on sugar plantations. They were prisoners of war. They were not uh, bound uh, permanently can, did not have their descendants uh, forced to, to work as well. Um, serfdom is also a form of coercive labor, the mita and the encomienda in the Spanish labor systems, um, as well as indentured servitude, um, which was particularly prominent in the Americas where um, poor English street urchins might uh, agree to sell their labor for five to seven years in, in the Americas in exchange for passage uh, 
over the Atlantic Ocean. Now, in some cases, indentured servants were treated much worse than slaves because slaves were an investment that you needed to keep alive. Whereas indentured servants, you could get another one at some point. So there's been some studies that have shown that uh, the death rate for indentured servants was much higher than that of slaves, chattel slaves, but that doesn't really change the fact that indentured servants could theoretically leave at some point. They could, they could complete their contract and go. And if they had children for some reason, their children were not required to fulfill their obligation, their debt, their, their, their labor obligation. Whereas in chattel slavery, it is continuous and it is uh, permanent. Your children, even if you had a thousand grandchildren, a thousand generations, you'd still be uh, a slave under the chattel system. And that's what makes it so fundamentally different from all the other systems that were in existence at this time. Now, some of them, again, some of them were on many ways on par with slavery, but chattel slavery stands out on its own, right? The cruelty could be on par. Humans could be cruel to one another, but as an institution, chattel slavery really stands out. And I just cannot stress that enough. This is a diagram of a slave ship. Um, and as you can see, uh, there is, um, not a lot of room. There was crammed to capacity. Again, if we're thinking of these individuals as, as property or an investment, you want to get the most out of your money. And if you know that potentially 20% of your cargo is going to die, you are going to put as many in there as you possibly can. Uh, this is a map of where most slaves went from the slave trade uh, here in uh, West and Central Africa. Uh, as you can notice, there's actually only a very teeny tiny line going to what is now the United States. Um, only about 15, if I'm remembering my numbers correctly, about 15% of slaves in the entire uh, slave trade went to the Americas. The vast majority went straight to Brazil, the Portuguese colonies. Um, this is also, by the way, where you might remember we talked about the Kingdom of Congo and the Dongo Matamba. That, that's right here. This is um, where those particular groups of slaves were from. So once slaves get into the Americas, um, they create what we would call the diaspora communities. Now, these existed on plantation life, and even though plantation life was super regimented and uh, brutal, slaves did nonetheless have some downtime in which they could form their languages, form their own communities. Um, and so within plantations, life went on, um, and we begin to see the creation of a uniquely Afro-American identity. And in certain places, you get an Afro-Caribbean identity, you get an afro uh, Brazilian identity. And one of the main markers of these identities is as a language. Now, these Creole languages were really interesting. In, in the United States, we say Creole, which is a unique blend of, of um, languages in what we now know, what is Louisiana, but Creole linguistically is simply when multiple languages come together to form a unique language. Um, and so one example is Aluku, which is a combination of French and West African, which is spoken in the nation of Suriname today, which is on the coast of South America. Um, this, this language is interesting. It went through a number of evolutions. Um, and mainly every time a group of slaves would escape from the plantation, they would bring another potentially different West African language uh, to the community uh, of runaway slaves. It, you might remember we talked a little bit about maroon communities back in chapter 24. And so uh, maroon communities sometimes also had their own languages that were formed either out of a combination of uh, West African languages and European languages, or sometimes a combination of several different West African languages, maybe mixed with Native American languages as well. Um, music and dance would come to define many of these societies, both on the plantation and in their maroon hideaways. Um, for example, samba is a very popular dance in Brazil that scholars almost universally recognize grew out of the dances of enslaved individuals, uh, really became popular in the 1920s and is now like universally recognized as a Brazilian thing. Um, the banjo, which is really popular in the United States, uh, was a, developed out of an African pluck instrument that slaves developed in the Caribbean. And so a lot of things that we take for granted in, in, in societies in the Americas, be it Brazil or the United States, um, really grew out of uh, the, the culture of the enslaved individuals. And of course, um, some of these maroon societies continue to remain religiously distinct from uh, their European overlords. So for example, voodoo continued. Um, it, it is a, voodoo is a, is a West African religious practice, mostly centered around the Igbo people, um, but it began to incorporate elements of Christianity and incorporate some Native American elements. And so voodoo continued to undergo its own evolution in the Caribbean and parts of South America. You also have the first Muslims in the United States were most likely uh, slaves, if not, f it, there's a debate among scholars of who were the first Muslims in the Americas. Um, some believe they were, were secret 
um, converts uh, who sailed with Columbus, like people who claimed to, to have converted to Christianity but didn't really. Um, but if not them, then it was most likely that African slaves were the first Muslims in the United States. And one of the more interesting stories we have is the story of Omar Ibn Said, um, who actually was in, uh, I believe it was South Carolina. Um, he escaped his plantation and he was caught and they took him to jail um, to, to wait for his owner to arrive. And while he was in jail, he started carving on the walls of the jail and people thought he was just drawing pictures and someone realized, oh, he's actually carving Arabic letters. And it turns out that uh, Omar Ibn Said was a scholar from West Africa who'd been caught up in a, in a slave raid. Um, and so he is, is widely recognized as one of the first uh, Muslims uh, in the in what later became the contemporary United States. Uh, there were other Muslims there too, but mostly on visiting uh, or diplomatic uh, missions. And so <clears throat> Omar ibn bin Said is, is an early interesting case of Islam in the United States. Um, it's also worth noting that whenever we talk about slaves, we really have to remember that slave revolts were very commonplace. Uh, you literally probably didn't go a decade without at least one or two slave revolts. Now, the first slaves brought to Hispaniola were in the early 1500s. I uh, believe 1510 was the first slaves brought to Hispaniola. And sure enough, 12 years later, you have the first revolted, re reported slave revolt in Christmas 1522. Uh, and in this particular case, these slaves were former soldiers from the Congo, uh, the Congo Empire, the Congo Kingdom, and they managed to beat off the Spanish who tried to charge at them with horses. Um, and while they were eventually captured and hung, they nonetheless uh, held their own for several days against the Spanish. Um, one of the largest slave revolts in the pre-American Revolution colonies uh, was in New York. Um, where a group of slaves uh, lit some fires to distract the town and then proceeded to um, uh, attack those who went to put out the fires uh, in an attempt to escape. Uh, and in this one is particularly interesting because women played a very large role uh, in organizing this one and passing messages between um, the, the people leading the revolt. And sometimes you actually had Maroons assisting in revolts and raids. This was very common. Uh, Brazil has a couple of really interesting instances where Maroons would actively uh, raid plantations that were kind of on the edges of European settlements and, and liberate the slaves that were there and bring them back to their communities. And of course, sl revolting slaves doesn't necessarily have to mean like violence as well. There was small scale resistance like work stoppages, breaking things. Uh, injuring oneself so you can't work. There was all sorts of ways that enslaved individuals attempted to hold on to their humanity in the face of a system that sought to systemically uh, dehumanize them. The African diaspora also included many freedmen. It's not that every single slave was either, every single African was either a slave or a runaway. There were also freedmen. So for example, Havana, which was the capital of Spanish Cuba, um, almost every single um, craftsman person in the capital was a free African or a mulatto. Um, in the United States, we talk a lot about the Boston Massacre as a prelude to the, um, the American Revolution. One of the first victims there was a free black named Crispus Attucks, who was a local, uh, local merchant, if I recall the story correctly. Um, you also have Adulo Aguiano, who was a local, um, uh, it was the son of a noble. If, again, if I'm remembering the story correctly, he's the son of a noble in Africa who was enslaved um, by accident and managed to gain his freedom um, after 17 years, and then wrote a very uh, telling account. He's, his account of the Middle Passage informs much of our knowledge about how horrendous and terrible it was. And he wrote uh, that he had never seen such uh, cruelties ever in, in his life as he saw in the Middle Passage. So um, it's really worth noting that yes, the system of slavery was widespread. Yes, it attempted to snuff out all individuality and sense of community, but nonetheless, uh, individuals uh, persisted and continued to exist. One of the phrases I always like to remind myself is that existence in the face of a slaving system, existence is resistance. And so we can't talk about the slave trade without covering the end of the slave trade. Um, this is often something that gets brought up a lot, which is that Great Britain was the first to end the slave trade. Not slavery itself, mind you, just the slave trade. And it was only did this in part um, because the um, Industrial Revolution was underway and the, uh, the slave interests in Parliament were losing their hold on, on the British government. Um, slavery was an expensive system. Uh, it was practical for a time, but you know the, the revolts, the, the work uh, sh shortages, and the fact that you had to maintain someone for their entire life made it a very ineffective in the long run. 
Um, although that is said, it's an, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that slavery would end. Uh, in some ways, Great Britain gets a little bit of credit um, for attempting to suppress the slave trade with its large navy. Although I say that, and on the other hand, the reason Britain did this was to weaken its rivals, Spain and Portugal, who did continue to import slaves into their colonies right up until the time that they lost their colonies. Uh, in Spain's case, they were still importing slaves into Cuba uh, right up until the Spanish-American War, usually in secret and not in very large numbers, but nonetheless, uh, same thing with Portugal and then slightly later Brazil until uh, 1688 or 1888, uh, Brazil being the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish uh, slavery. Um, and even though Britain likes to take a lot of credit for abolishing the slave trade, um, <clears throat> British interests in West Africa continue to fund activities that were well known to lead to slavery. So for example, the Industrial Revolution, which took place in Great Britain, and nonetheless required uh, raw materials like palm oil. And palm oil in West Africa then, uh, in some ways as palm oil now in other parts of the world, as well as other uh, luxury goods in other parts of the world, required a labor system. And in this case of Africa, with the abolition of the slave trade, uh, had, an, had a, an abundance of workers and slaves in which they could use um, for this uh, for this industry of palm oil, which the British demanded. So the British kind of got to wash their hands of slavery uh, while slavery continued to become more intensified in Africa itself. So it is true that Great Britain is the first European nation to abolish the slave trade and attempt to suppress it, but we should not give credit there only because they didn't do this uh, out of some, while individuals may have, um, individual like religious leaders may have done this out of a sense of altruism, um, the economic and, and political interests in Britain did not do this out of a sense of altruism. They did this out of a sense of political expediency and a shifting uh, balance of what was beneficial uh, to economic interests in the country. When we talk about the end of the slave trade and we talk about the end of slavery, it's important to remember all of those slave revolts. And when we talk about Haiti, this will become much more clear. Anyways, you should be able to answer those two questions from the beginning of the video. I want to thank you for joining me on this bite of history. My name is Mr. Little, and I will see you next time.